this week on Market to Market. Shaking up a niche market with a fresh local supply. And market analysis with Dan Huber. Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hey everybody, I'm Paul Yeager and I have to grab my notebook because I want to make sure I get everything that we're going to cover in this week's podcast. This is the MTOM, which is a production of Iowa PBS and the Market to Market TV show. If you have any feedback for me, always, my email's always open. So is my DMs on Twitter if you prefer that way. Paul.Yeager at iowapbs.org is how you would get a hold of me. Each Tuesday we have new episodes of the podcast. One of the things I love is being able to travel around the country or the world from right here in the podcast studio. Just got uh, hung up the, on the mic uh, processing an interview uh, that you're going to see with Laura Pascas. She's with New Mexico PBS. Uh, she covers a lot of environmental issues. She's primarily an environmental reporter uh, for the station there in Albuquerque. And we're going to talk a lot about the environment. It is so dry in New Mexico, as of the recording, they've gone 56 days in Albuquerque without measurable rainfall. It has been a very dry situation, several years in the cycle. What's that mean for agriculture, for water, for topography, for climate, for the environment? We're going to get into a lot of those discussions, but kind of cover some of the stories and just some of the bleak outlook it is right now, unless something changes with the rain and just the environment in general. So we're going to cover a whole lot of that. We're going to go back into the history and talk about the 1950s drought and how something that happened then is impacting everyone right now. So stay tuned for this podcast, which is called the MTOM. Thank you so very much for sticking with us so far. But now let's talk with Laura Paskus from New Mexico PBS. New Mexico's had quite the time in the headlines recently here, Laura. It has been, and I'm not even talking about the weather. I'm talking about pop culture. I wanted to start with, that's where High School Musical is based. But you, you're you telling me Breaking Bad, Stranger Things, uh, the Alec Baldwin movie was in New Mexico. I mean, you've been busy. What's the deal with New Mexico? Everybody wanting to be there. It's a little different, though, right now. It doesn't, the, things don't look the same as they were. You've been there how long? I first moved here in 1996. And that was from where? From Virginia. It's, but you're not from Virginia originally, is that correct? That's right. I grew up in Connecticut, in western Connecticut. Green, green place. A lot of trees in western Connecticut. <laughs> It's a beautiful place, yeah. Uh, so then how'd you end up in in New Mexico? Um, so after I graduated from the University of Virginia with a bachelor's in anthropology, I realized my career options were like, you know, waitressing or I could um, go into contract archaeology. So I did contract archaeology and then tribal consultation for about six years before transitioning into journalism. So archaeology, what were some of the things you were looking for? Yeah, so I worked for a private company and we would get hired by federal and state agencies during the NEPA or the um, NHPA process um, to kind of go ahead of construction projects or land transfer projects, road widenings, things like that, to survey and excavate any um, historic or prehistoric archaeological remains. What, that's got to be a rewarding field, but it also has to be a frustrating field because you spend, yeah. I, I get the impression you would have spent an incredible amount of time trying to find or preserve or uncover one little thing. Did it feel that way? Yeah. You know, the thing for me was I loved the field work. I loved working outside. I wor loved working in different landscapes. It was amazing. I, I loved that. I did not love the destructive nature of the job. And then when I moved into tribal consultation, I thought it was a job where I would be working closely with tribes to kind of tweak projects to make them less damaging to either sacred sites or um, live, living communities. And I quickly realized that that is not what tribal consultation is. 
and became, you know, really bummed out. And so journalism for me was a natural transition to continue learning about landscapes and communities, but to do so in a way that was um, interacting with and helping educate the public. You were uncovering things. You just didn't have to physically go and uh, rip away some type of layer to get what you're at. Would you say archaeology and writing a book are similar in their approaches? It seems like it goes on and on forever, and it comes out to a tiny little thing. That's a good way to put it, actually. Yeah, I, you know, I thought that writing a book about climate change would be pretty straightforward because the, the impacts are so clear, the science is straightforward. But what I found was the the climate was changing and we were seeing the impacts, you know, sort of more quickly than even a, a book, particularly an academic press book can really get <laughs> published. So there was a lot of rewriting up until the last minute because things are changing so rapidly, particularly here in the Southwest. And the book was called At the Precipice. Do I have that right? Yeah. What but, uh, was that your first book? Yes. Well, I've contributed to books um, over the past 20 years, but this was the first one that was like my baby. <laughs> okay. What, I mean, you kind of talked a little bit about what prompted you to do it, but what finally sent you over in to say, yes, I'm going to put ideas to paper? Yeah. So I've been reporting on the environment in New Mexico since 2002 and and reporting pretty regularly on climate change since probably 2006. And I really wanted to take kind of the breadth of what I have been learning and put it in a format that was all in one place that people didn't have to be looking at coverage over years, um, put it all in one place and kind of have what I had hoped would be almost like a field guide for people who want to understand what's happening and also for decision makers who maybe um, aren't up to date on all the latest science and are being confronted with the politics of climate change all the time, really wanted to just lay out all the facts of what's happening, why we know it's happening, um, and, and a little bit of what can be done. I'm going to step in it here a little bit with our own coverage at Market to Market. Any time for a period of time recently that we would put the word climate change or some type of weather story that didn't seem to be straight, here's how much rain fell, here's how much snow fell, here's how dry, there would be an accusation of using it politically, not scientifically. Then there's the argument of, well, that's not real science, or that's not, that's manipulated science. I'm guessing that was, a, you kept coming to that theme over and over again in your research. Yeah. You know, when I first started reporting on the environment and climate change back in the earlier 2000s, there really was still this mentality in the in the press that if you were reporting on climate change, you had to quote from, you know, a scientist who had spent their entire career, uh, you know, decades of peer reviewed research. And then you would have to counterbalance what that person was saying with, you know, oftentimes a, a public relations person paid by an industry to um, deny climate change. And thankfully, we have largely moved away from that in American media, finally. Um, but there still is there still is a lot of pushback from from a certain sector of people. And and I'll be honest, um, I have become increasingly comfortable with ignoring those voices who I feel like are are trying to foment controversy where there is none or um, encourage doubt where there is none. And um, yeah, but I, it's tricky. And I've seen I've seen pushback against my climate reporting really decrease in the last few years. And I'm not entirely sure if it's because that very small sector of the population um, is is getting increasingly smaller or if they turn their attention more toward um, COVID issues, which it felt like during the pandemic. So I, I, I think what I'm hearing you say a little bit here, Laura, is you're okay with criticism when it has a valid 
<laughs> background and uh, uh, I won't say science defense, but something that is defendable. But if there is something that's factless, baseless, you're just like you turn the other cheek and and move on. Do I am I catching you right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a good point because like this, the, um, you know, the beauty of science is that the more questions we ask, the more we learn and you learn more and more over time. Um, so it's it's an exciting field to keep up with because there are things that change and that we learn. And I want to hear from those people. And I definitely want to hear from people who, you know, have a have a concern about the reporting. It's not what they're seeing in their community or it doesn't represent their community. Like, I love hearing from those people, but if you're just like tweeting, um, you know, not nice or not accurate things, like I'm just gonna have to go about my day without you. <laughs> I just heard an interview over the noon hour, very similar response to what you had just said. Let's talk about your community, your state right now as we sit here today in late May. Uh, I just got done posting, uh, I was doing a little research about, I wanted to be up a little more on New Mexico before we talked. Uh, the the national weather, NOAA and uh, the weather data people have a map and you can adjust. I want to look at the one day, the seven day. The, I looked at the 30 day map. Uh, there is a region from, say, West Texas through New Mexico, Arizona, almost all of California, southern part of Nevada, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, or Wyoming. You haven't had any rain in a month. What is your land around you is dry. How dry is it? Yeah, I think the number here in Albuquerque, as of yesterday, I think I was looking at it, we had gone 56 days without any measurable precipitation. But if you look at the drought map for New Mexico, 90% of the state is an extreme drought and 45% is an exceptional drought. And, you know, we're seeing this play out on the landscape in a number of ways. Of course, farmers and ranchers are very much feeling the, the pinch of this long-term persistent drought. Um, we've had a very, very windy spring and coupled coupling those winds with warmer than average temperatures and no precipitation. We're seeing uh, dust storms, we're seeing um, an absolutely unprecedented fire season for April and May in New Mexico. Um, we're seeing, you know, higher levels of evaporation from our reservoirs and lakes. Our peak snowmelt on the Rio Grande, which is the largest river in the state, was about three weeks early. And, you know, the, the stream flows are far below the historic average, even when you look at the new, the sort of adjusted for the new normal. Um, and so it's just, I mean, it's its brutal. I've, I've, like I said, I've been here since 96. I've been covering climate change for a long time. This year even surprised me. And, and it's, it's, it's been like nothing I've ever seen before. You haven't had a day in 2022, any part of your state outside of, of drought conditions. And you mentioned... 90% uh, extreme. Uh, I remember California, and I, when it had its l major drought uh, recently in the last decade, it was similar to that. Did you see that there, there has been a setup in this pattern that we were getting drier, or has this just kind of come about in the last 18 months? Yeah, I mean, there's been persistent drought moving around the U.S. Southwest for 22 years now. Um, and you'll see it, you know, sometimes it's more severe in California, sometimes more severe in kind of the, the Southwest, our, our part of the Southwest. Um, but this has just been a persistent pattern for, for decades now. And, you know, we'll have a good year. Um, it, it's still natural variability in the system that you'll have a good year here and there, but even in a good year, um, the soils can't catch up, the forests can't catch up, all of that. But I think for the U.S. Southwest, with you know the arid Southwest, for us, warming really means drying. So even if you have a close to normal snowpack, it's warmer. So that snowpack melts earlier. 
the forests, the farmlands, the soils, everything pulls more moisture out. So it really is, you know, I, I hate that phrase, new normal, but, you know, we're warmer and we're drier now. Well, if you're saying it as many years as it's been going on, it is the, it's not new anymore. It's the normal uh, almost. I mean, we talk about weather patterns. I've had a climatologist that we've cited, past guest on this podcast, who talks about decadal oscillation, that we we have wet periods, we have dry periods, we have unstable periods. You are definitely in a dry period. What does that mean for, you mentioned the agriculture area, but I mean, a lot of people have this preconceived notion, back to what I said at the very beginning about uh, the, the, the popular culture references to your state. We think of it as a, a dry land, a desert land. It's not all that way. So what does this dry, who is impacted the most when it has been this dry? Yeah, so our farmers definitely have been struggling for a long time. And you know, one of the one of the problems is, you know, the New Mexico experienced a big drought in the 1950s. That was devastating for farmers. And kind of to get through that, I mean, many people did not get through that that drought as as farmers. But to get through that, what happened was a lot of communities, a lot of farms shifted from relying on only surface water to pumping groundwater. And we see across the state now these major groundwater depletions, because even in the good times of the 80s and the 90s, we continue to really rely on groundwater pumping. So now we're in a situation where you see decreased surface flows um, and depleted groundwater levels. So this is a, has a big impact on the farming and ranching community, um, to be sure. But this year, an additional um, you know, really huge impact is we've had a fire season in April and May. Like that's that's just unprecedented where we had fires blowing up in mid-April, destroying um, hundreds of homes down in the southern part of the state. And currently we have four major fires burning in New Mexico. The two biggest ones, um, the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire is about 313,000 acres right now. It's currently the largest wildfire in New Mexico state history. Um, hundreds, thousands of homes destroyed, tens of thousands of people evacuated. And then down in the southwestern part of the state, we have the Black Fire burning right now, which ignited on May 13th and has already grown. Um, I don't have the numbers for today. I think it's like 176,000 acres in you know 13 days that's just cranking and cooking and so what that does aside from you know the immediate impacts of people losing their homes and their um their ranch lands their traditional homelands all of that you have these long-term impacts of watershed all sorts of downstream watershed impacts the forests are changing um in some places we have conifer forests that are dying from drought and heat stress. And then after a fire, it's so much warmer now than when these forests first were born, so to speak. Um, we see these entire tens of thousands of acres of forest transition into something entirely different. I, I think just last week, maybe did, did New Mexico set a record for most uh, I think uh, the largest or the most acres burned in a year and it was already only yeah. mid-May. Uh, yeah. So does that, does that give you incredible concern, somewhat concern for what comes ahead in June, July, and August, if you continue on this dry pattern? Yeah, it makes me very scared. Honestly, our fire season, like the scariest part of our fire season is typically June um, before the monsoons start coming. Um, but, you know, we, we've already burned over a half a million acres and it's the end of May. Um, so I'm nervous about June, but even beyond that, we're, we're in New Mexico um, moving into our third La Nina pattern in a row. So we're looking at another dry summer and another dry winter. And so, um, yeah, I'm really nervous. You know, just last night, I live in Albuquerque. Um, about a mile from the Rio Grande. And our beautiful Rio Grande has a forest, um, a bosque 
alongside um, beautiful cottonwood canopy, um, just an incredible place right through the center of Albuquerque. It's, it's really magnificent. And last night, um, the Bosque caught on fire near my house and, you know, rode my bike out to the bridge to watch this magnificent place burning. Um, it's happening in the mountains. It's happening in our cities. It's, it's nerve wracking. <laughs> And when you have, I, I, I mean, I look at the wildfires of, say, California, which we kind of pay attention to a little more because we see them more on a regular basis. Some of those wildfires, they make the news when they get into more of the, the, the city areas. When you're saying in the middle of Albuquerque, a major metropolitan area, when the, the fire is going through, that has to grab people's attention. Is there anything <laughs> that can be done? You know, term. I think in the short term, you know, officials are, you know, we've, the Forest Service has closed many of the forests, um, city open space, state parks, all of these places are closing right now to keep people out who make bad decisions, who have a campfire, you know, so that's like one of the immediate things that's happening is all of these public lands, all of these spaces are having to be closed. Um, because they're already overwhelmed with the fires that are happening. Um, you know, the fire that I mentioned that happened last night, thankfully it was spotted early enough. I don't have total acres on it, but there were evacuations that were then called off, but like an incredible ecosystem is, is, is harmed. Um, you know, kind of in the, the, the longer term, a big, controversy in New Mexico and across the West is prescribed fire mm. for national forests. And, you know, the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire that I mentioned, that's at 313,000 acres and affected thousands, tens of thousands of people started as a prescribed fire that got out of control. But, but prescribed fire when done under the right conditions is one of the only tools we really have in the West to start dealing with are just dry and overgrown forests. Uh, two things that have come out of our conversation so far that I do want to get to. Let's start with the water issue. We'll come back to the the farming side of things. Uh, the Rio Grande, uh, like the Colorado, less flows, major rivers in, in your region of the country. Uh, I, I think you said something about even when snow falls in the mountains, when it's hotter, drier, earlier, it melts it quicker, faster. And I'm, and I'm guessing, I, I think you said evaporation is an issue. So we're talking drinking water. You can't dig into the water, uh, the ground anymore because you've, you've sucked a whole bunch of that out over generations. Um, water, how big is this water story for those of us who don't live there or tour there on a regular basis, we hear about water. I have people tell me water is the next big battle in this country. You're living that right now. So tell me, how big of a deal is this water story when the rivers are so low? Yeah, the Rio Grande, you know, the Colorado River gets lots of attention for, for many re reasons, including the fact that it's a bigger population, a bigger geographic area that relies on the Colorado. But all of those problems on the Colorado are, are happening on the Rio Grande. Um, I've been covering, I've been writing about the Rio Grande since 2002, and it was the first time I had seen the river dry. This is the state's largest river, and it, it typically dries in the summer for long stretches up to, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles. And because we supplement um, city water with groundwater because farmers, you know, make it one more year. There isn't, there isn't the attention on the Rio Grande that I, I really think needs to happen. And I've really struggled to understand why the river drying and why New Mexico's water challenges don't receive the same sort of attention as they do in other parts of the country. Um, I think people are becoming more aware in part because, you know, within the last couple of years, water managers were not able to keep the Albuquerque stretch of the Rio Grande flowing in a way that people are accustomed to seeing. 
And so seeing the river dry, seeing the river really low, seeing the sandhill cranes come back in the fall and not have water in the river, I think is starting to raise more public awareness of this crisis. But I'm still surprised that state legislators don't prioritize water planning, water funding. I look at what states like even Colorado and Texas, our neighbors up and downstream are doing. And it's remarkable to me that New Mexico is not being more proactive on its water challenges. How big is the the story of water rights, junior water rights? I mean, we hear about that in specifically California, but we hear it in other states too. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge issue. And, you know, we've seen here in the state where typically farmers are the ones who have um, senior water rights and cities have junior water rights. And you've seen lots of um, water transfers over the years. Um, a lot of places like the city of Albuquerque had pledged a couple of years ago that they were no longer going to buy agricultural water rights because it was, a, you know, having adverse effect on other communities. Um, I, I just, we, we, we keep squeaking by and I don't know for how many years that's, that's going to be a reality. I mean, what's the dire situation? I mean, are we talking what? You're going to have to pipe water in from somewhere else? I think we see, we definitely see, if we don't address these water challenges, we will see an end to um, irrigated agriculture in the state. And that includes everything from traditional Pueblo or Hispanic communities that are irrigating off of um, acequias for subsistence agriculture, for um, you know alfalfa for their livestock, for their horses and cattle, to large-scale farms in the southern part of the state with, um, say, green chili, pecans, onions, things like that. You know, one of the things that I always think is really interesting is down in southern New Mexico, where there had been a lot of alfalfa and green chili and even some cotton. Um, you know, recognizing that there were water shortages and water challenges coming, there was a big push in southern New Mexico to encourage farmers to switch from flood irrigating field like alfalfa fields, for example, and to plant um, pecans and other orchards like that. And really now what we're seeing is you know, you can get away with fallowing an alfalfa field for a year or two and hope that you'll have a better year next year, but you can't fallow your orchard. You can't not water your orchard. And so um, I know that there are researchers in particular at New Mexico State University who are really like trying to deal with these problems and think about agriculture that uses less water. Um, but as a state, and certainly politically in New Mexico, we need to really get our act together. Are there states or, when you mention uh, New Mexico State University, I mean, are there other institutions that maybe you look at, that leaders of the state look at for guidance or ideas in how, in, how to deal with this? I mean, yes, drought-resistant plants or drought-more-tolerant plants are, are possible, they're not practical right away, take a long time. Who do you look for uh, in guidance? Yeah, one of the things that I think is really um, special about New Mexico is we are a very diverse state. And like with anything, um, diversity strengthens you. When The more diverse you are, the more resilient you are, right? And so for New Mexico, we have, you know, um, like roughly 20 different tribes. We have the Asakia community. We have all sorts of traditional communities who know how to weather crisis, whether that crisis is, you know, ancient droughts where people moved out of places like Chaco Canyon and moved into the Rio Grande Valley, or, you know, a crisis of, of colonialism, crisis of, you know, repeated waves of conquest and these communities have survived and thrived and I think there are a lot of lessons for for people to learn from traditional agriculture from traditional models of cooperation um and so that's like when when I start feeling really like 
frustrated and, and like hopeless about New Mexico because the challenges seem so extreme right now, I look to our diversity as, as a way that if we communicate better, if we cooperate better, if, if everybody is invited to the table, there are, there are ways for us to figure out how to weather these challenges. Well, let's face it. Some of the folks that were on the land hundreds and hundreds of years ago did not have the scientific modeling to predict rain, but they figured out that it didn't rain and they were able to preserve water or preserve resources for another time. So yes, yeah. that is some guidance of that you have right there in state. So that is, yeah. I would imagine, uh, some sign of relief. Uh, let's go to the other side. You've you've kind of we've danced a little bit with it on the agriculture side. Um, irrigation is a is a hot topic in all these same areas that that you mentioned uh, f- for drought conditions. Uh, I believe your one of your senators today was uh, speaking to uh, Secretary Vilsack at USDA about drought and said, "My dairy farmers need some assistance. What is the dairy?" rancher situation, the livestock side of things uh, happening right now in New Mexico? Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to bring, I'm going to make, I'm going to bring even more bad news. (laughs) Oh boy, just, yeah, we're going to call this one the happy fun time with Laura. That's great. (laughs) So the story that we've been following at New Mexico PBS for years um, is is how the U.S. military contaminated um, a a significant dairy down in the southeastern part of the state. Um, And so, um, you know, these are, the the dairies are predominantly in New Mexico in the southeastern part of the state around Clovis and Portales. And um, one of those, two of those dairies were contaminated by PFAS from Cannon Air Force Base. And one of the dairies in particular um, you know, making his living, uh, relying on groundwater. There's no surface water in that part of the state. So they're relying exclusively on pumping groundwater. Um, he had been pumping this groundwater for decades for his dairy cows and his family and found out in 2018 that the U.S. Air Force had contaminated this water with PFAS. And so he has been the last three years trying to get help um, and just um, within the last month or so had to euthanize his entire mm. herd of 3,600 dairy cows. So that's the story that we've been covering. I'm not as familiar with like the dairy industry as a whole. <laughs> so sorry. Well, no, and that's okay. Um, but that is a that is a story that no one likes to hear. And unfortunately, it might happen in other places with contaminated water. I'm not necessarily who the, the, the source is of the contamination. But um, f- outlooks uh, are, are, are tough to find in a, in a story like that. So I guess, uh, if do we have any positives of what's going on here out of this? Is, is it, or has there been other negatives? Because has New Mexico taken on new residents as people leave other larger cities and you're having new residents come in and you're, and is that stressing resources? I guess it's supposed to be a positive new people moving to the region, but more people taxing the limited resources. Yeah, I think, you know, during the pandemic, I think a lot of, um, I think a lot of people in California who were um, tired of things like high cost of living and traffic, but also the wildfires and the smoke from wildfires started looking at New Mexico as a really attractive place to relocate, especially if they were going to be working from home um, and could sort of telecommute to their jobs in California. And, you know, the city of Albuquerque in particular, you know, really tried to woo Californians to move here. Um, and, you know, who am I to say where people should or shouldn't live? But, um, you know, we've seen our real estate prices just skyrocket, which has a really devastating impact on, on New Mexicans. Um, and so, you know, it's always, it's always a, a tricky thing to, um, to, to kind of determine the benefits and the negatives. But 
I would hope that anybody who moves to New Mexico, and you know, I'm not a native of New Mexico, and I've tried to understand the culture here and understand the landscapes and communities and, and, and be a part of this landscape and culture versus trying to impose my ideas, you know, having grown up in Connecticut. <laughs> Um, and I would hope that people who moved to New Mexico now would have that that same sort of respect for our our limits, really. And you have to live within the land. It is as your as the title right behind you, the our land. Um, it, it, and that's that's true, I think, in any con- uh, state in this country is we have to live within the means of the land and be respectful of whatever it is because that land can provide for families and prov- and has provided for generations. It's just your land is a little different than my land, which is different than those in Michigan as or Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right, Laura, uh, what's the next thing you're working on? What's the biggest thing that uh, folks could uh, check out some of your work? Uh, self-promotion time here. <laughs> yeah, so at New Mexico PBS, we have this great... Um, program. I'm really thankful that I get to do all the environmental coverage that I do. Um, Our program is called Our Land, New Mexico's Environmental Past, Present, and Future. And we've been doing our show for five years this summer. Um, And so we cover all kinds of things, you know, uh, drought and fire, but we also, um, you know, go out into communities and learn about sort of how they are um, either healing the landscape or living within their landscape. And so um, we, we try to balance out some of the, the tough news with, with um, stories of, of hope and resilience, but yeah. <laughs> and in the beauty of uh, what, what a PBS uh, television station can do is, I, I, I think your station is similar to, to many others you are able to capture the beauty with the, the video camera and really show off just some of the stunning views, vistas, mountains, high, low, everything that you have. You have such an incredible uh, canvas to work with there. Yeah, thank you. All right. Laura Pascas from New Mexico PBS, thank you so very much for the time. Thanks, Paul. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching new episodes each and every Tuesday. We love it when you like, share, and subscribe. Yes, I know I sound old when I say make that plea, but kids do it too, so I'm going to as well. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time.